Oh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Today I want to speak about a subject that very important to God the Father and Jesus Christ. And it's a subject that seems to be uh, almost insignificant to the world. And uh, we don't consider this sin. And at this time of the year with all the uh, preparations for Christmas festivities and all this kind of thing. And, uh, the world in this area especially is almost overwhelmed with everything that's going on uh, in preparation for celebration of Christmas holidays, buying the presents and shopping and all the different things that are going on. And it's so badly needed, the commercial part of it, and it, that's what it is basically now, a commercial um, holiday. If we didn't have it, just, we'd probably go bankrupt in this country. There's a lot of different businesses and shops and everything depend on this particular time of the year to, to make any money. This way they might make 75% of their, their money you know, for the whole year. The subject I want to speak about today is idolatry. It's the sin that we don't consider. And the world doesn't consider how often do you think about idolatry? Last year, I gave a message uh, titled Looking Toward the Passover, or Forward to the Passover. And I gave an example that we need to go through the Ten Commandments and examine ourselves to each commandment so we could uh, be ready to accept the Passover. Uh, so that's what I want to do today. I want to begin maybe a series on, on the Ten Commandments and starting off with idolatry. Now we know that uh, commandment number one and commandment number two speaks of idolatry. It speaks about graven images. But there's also another commandment that, that deals with idolatry, and that's the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet. That's related to idolatry. So if, if you uh, look looking for a title for the sermon, I titled it, Idolatry, the Sin That We Don't Consider. Let's just turn to Exodus 20, and we'll, we'll read the commandment in Exodus 20. And I'll, I'll begin reading in verse 1. It said, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the eternal your God, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Now he was giving this to Israel. And today we are Israel, so it is to us also. In verse four he says, you shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the earth above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them. For I, the eternal God, am a jealous God, and I visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations. And I do that to those who hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and they keep my commandments. So God tells us that he doesn't want us to put anything before him. He wants our attention, and he wants our love, and wants our concern, and he wants us to live a life where we honor and worship him, and worship him only. The world uh, doesn't believe that, but it doesn't, don't pay attention to it. And you know, over here we have different religions, different different uh, denominations, and there are a few of them that just blatantly break that commandment without any thought. They change some of the scriptures to fit their desires, and they think nothing of uh, bowing down before idols. 
And it'll do all kinds of things with no concept of what it is to keep the first and second commandment. Let's uh, look at the definitions of idolatry. One is, uh, is idolatry is the worship of a physical image, a statue, a statue or a picture or a representation of what we consider a religious connection. Or it can be the excessive adoration of anything that we hold more important than God and that we spend more time with and that we enjoy. You know, that's that a side of idolatry that we don't necessarily look at all that much. Another definition, which includes that second one that I gave you, is uh, about an idol. An idol is any, anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than what you admire God. Anything that you seek to give you what, what you seek to give you what only God can give. And we do have a lot of things in our lives that we spend more time with. And we see God, uh, we put it before God, especially our time. We devote our time to a lot of different things more than we devote time to God. And that is considered idolatry. And we need to ask ourselves and examine ourselves to see where we fall short. Man uses uh, idolatry as a vehicle to do different things. Uh, one point would be idolatry is an attempt to fulfill the human need for a spiritual connection with God. We're looking for something physical, you know, so we can have that spiritual connection. If you're close to God and you know God, you don't need that physical connection. That's one of the things that we do. Now, idolatry contains mysterious things, uh, secret things. Uh, I know one of the university church always has supernatural mysteries all the time. When you don't have an answer for a question, you consider it, it's a mystery. Mystery Babylon the Great. I know I had, my brother is uh, involved in that. And even as a young boy, uh, I have an aunt that, that uh, always talking about secret things, always got some kind of secret thing going, a mystery or, or whatever. And it, I, I didn't like it at all because I wanted to know what was going on, and, it, and I'd ask questions, and it was always a mystery. And they even went farther away from just religious things. There was something they didn't want you to know. It was a mystery. God is going to correct that one of these days. Another thing to use is idolatry is a, an attempt to exert power over the gods and over nature. It involves uh, trying to bribe God. We don't word it that way. We don't put it in those words. But they're looking for God to make special uh, adjustments so they can do what they want. They can get the higher power to do what somebody else wills. And man also uses idolatry for the f sexual freedom that it affords. And they've been doing that all through history, even to the point of uh, temple prostitution, which is idolatrous. Now, we all know that God limits Sexual activity is between a man and a woman. No other gender between a man and a woman in marriage. You know, living together and shacking up is not uh, allowed by God. It's a part of idolatry. Let's take a look at... Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, we'll see that when I said uh, that um, 
that the other part of coveting was a, a part of idolatry. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. He said, mortify therefore your members. He's saying like put to death your members. Uh, overcome your feelings. He said, put to, uh, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, such as fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So if you, you covet... Uh, different things. Or maybe you covet another God. It's idolatry. So there's three chap three commandments out of ten that deal with uh, idolatry. But idolatry permeates all the others. It's part of the cause why you commit the other sins with breaking the commandments. Now here in this country, we uh, we have a number, of, you know, hundreds of different religious groups, but some uh, have a, a monotheistic approach. You have one God that they look forward to or look to, and then you have the polytheistic, where there are many gods. And especially in, in foreign countries, they they have all kinds of gods. Now, thankfully, uh, and I, I guess that we have some of that in the United States, too, because those foreigners are moving into our country. And they're changing the, the scope of the way things are and uh, the way things are done in the United States are changing because these people have an effect on us. Now, ancient Israel was uh, always paying attention to foreign gods, you know, idolatry. And, and God, that was God's favorite people. You know, he did all he could to, to bless them in every way that he could, and yet they always turned to foreign gods. So God punished ancient Israel, and he used Assyria to punish him. It broke his heart to have to do that. But mankind well, just won't listen. Now he's going to use Assyria again to punish Israel of this day. And it doesn't look like it's all that far off. Because we're so idolatrous. And we never even consider it. We don't look at, a, at idolatry as serious a sin as stealing or killing someone. But God puts it number one. It's number one because it's the thing that he's most concerned with. That's why he started it that way. He wants us to worship him. And he's doing his part to do everything he can for us. You know, he calls us out of, calls us out of this world and gives us his spirit. He shares everything with us. Now, he blesses the rest of the world also. We live in, here in the United States. We, we're doing well, you know, uh, compared to the rest of the world. Even though we are idolatrous. We don't follow his commandments. We don't worship him. We don't do anything on schedule like we're supposed to do. We don't even think about it. Yet he blesses us and he gives us, he forgives us and gives us chance after chance after chance. And he does that with us who are converted. He forgives us and he shares everything that he has with us. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 5. Ezekiel chapter 5. We'll begin by reading verses 1 through 4. It says, And you, son of man, take you a sharp knife, and take you a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon your head and upon your beard, and take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. You shall burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled, that you shall take a third part and smite about it with a knife, and a third part you shall scatter into the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. You shall also take a, a few in number, a remnant, 
and bind them in your skirts. This is the prophecy that God is using to teach us, uh, to tell us what is, is going to happen. Verse 4 says, take, take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire thereof uh, shall a fire come forth into the house of Israel. So Israel, Israel is going to be punished for the idolatry that they've committed. In verse 8 through 12, he continues, he said, and this, is, this is talking about future. It says, therefore, says the Lord God, behold, I, I, even as I am against you, and will execute judgment in the midst of you in the sight of the nations. And I will do in you that which I have not done, and unto, unto, uh, whereunto I will not do any more of the like because of all your abominations. Idolatry is an abominable thing to God. It's an abomination. It said, Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of you, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgment in you, and the whole remnant of, of you will I scatter into all the winds. So there's a time coming when we're going to do some horrible things because of the punishment that we're receiving and because we won't have food and a lot of different things that will come upon us. It says, Wherefore, as I live, said the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your de detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore will I also diminish you, neither shall mine eyes spare you, neither will I have any pity. A third part of you shall die with pestilence and with famine. And with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of you. A third part shall fall by the sword round about you. And I will scatter a third part into the winds. And I will draw a sword after them. So God is going to punish those who are idolatrous. And those who will not keep his commandments. Let's take a look at uh, uh, the examples of a, uh, a couple of kings. The first Kings, uh, chapter 15. First Kings, chapter 15. We'll begin in verse 9. First Kings, verse 9. He said, in the 20th year of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, reigned, uh, king of Israel, the king of Israel reigned Asa over Judah. Asa uh, was the king at the time, and he said, and 41 years he reigned in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, Maacah the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of, his, of the Lord, as did his father David. And he took the Sodomites out of the land and he removed all the idols that their father had. And Maker's mother, he, he removed her because she being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove, and Asa destroyed her, uh, her, her idol and burned it and took it in the book Kindred. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord in all his days. And he brought into the things which his father had dedicated and those things him, which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord with silver and gold and, and vessels. She had her idols and God burned them up. Her idols were made out of wood. When they talk about going into the grove, that's an area where they were using the wood from the grove to make idols. And they, they made these idols and they hung them up on trees, just like you would say you're decorating a Christmas tree. And they did that kind of thing. And God uh, was angry about that, so he burned them. And we'll see that later on in another example. In 2 Kings, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 23. We use, uh, we use this example just a few weeks back. 
when we talked about King Josiah. Second Kings, Kings 23, verses 3 through 9. It said, The king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in his book. And all the people stood to the covenant. He's talking about the covenant agreement he made with Josiah. And Josiah's main goal at the time was to remove all the idols and idolatrous priests from that, from that land. Um, verse 4, the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, the foreign god, and for the grove, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without, outside of Jerusalem in the field of the kindred. And he carried the ashes unto them unto Bethel. And he put the idolatrous priest, whom the kings of Judah had ordained, to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah, and in the places round about Jerusalem. And also he burned incense unto Baal to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out of the grove from the house of the Lord outside of Jerusalem unto the brook Kindred, and he burned it at the brook. Kindred, the brook Kindred, and stamped it, uh, you know, so small that it turned to powder, and he cast the powder there on the graves of the children of the people. And he broke down the houses of the Sodomites, and they were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings from the grove. That's what I was talking about. They were hanging these wooden idols that they had made on the trees in the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah, and he defiled the high places uh, where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gate that were entering into the gate of, the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priest of the high places came not to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among the brethren. So Josiah not only destroyed the idols and everything, he also had them keeping the holy days. He's trying to get Israel back on track and get rid of the idolatry that they had. Let's turn to, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll begin reading in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Moreover, brethren, I, w I wish that you would not uh, I wish you weren't ignorant, but how all the fathers were under the cloud and all that passed through the sea. And they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in, in the sea. And they did eat the same spiritual meat, and they did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that was Christ. Remember when Christ was leading them in a cloud. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And while they were in the desert, they were overthrown. Now these things are for our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. You know, traveling like that from place to place, I guess they're dissatisfied with the way things were going. They wanted other things. And many of them lusted after other gods. Even though they were keeping, uh, being led by a God, they were looking somewhere else for something physical that they could worship. So he says, neither be you idolaters as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. It says, Never, uh, neither let uh, commit fornication, 
as some of them had committed. And there fell in one day 23,000 individuals. That's a lot of people. 23,000 individuals were, were killed that day. That's the way it would be to, even more than that. Today in our society, we would, we were killing all those who had committed uh, fornication and, and other things. Our, con our country is rampant with sexual sins today. All kinds of sexual sins. Things that we would never dream of. If it was back in that day, God would have smote them right there. So 23,000 people lost their lives. It said, neither let them tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you as some of them had murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for our example and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth or ends of the world are come. So wherefore let that let him that think he stands take heed lest he falls. That's a warning for us. It says, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you and not permit you to be tempted above what you are able but with the temptation also make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. We get, when we get ourselves in problems like that we need to go to God and God say he's there for us and he will make a way of escape. He will help us to get out of our trouble. These are all sins of the flesh that they, they are committing. There's a list of them in Galatians. Verse 14, he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. You know, God says flee from fornication. And we, we know fornication is a, 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 an evil sin. But idolatry is an evil sin. He says flee it. And all of us are guilty of some form of idolatry. We just need to examine ourselves. We need to learn the different things that are idolatrous. So he tells us, he said, don't lust after evil things like the Israelites did. Don't be idolaters. Don't commit fornication. Don't commit idolatry. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. This is scriptures that we read during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover season. We'll begin reading in verse 9. He said, I wrote unto you an, ep uh, an epistle not to uh, keep company with fornicators. You know, we need to choose our company well. And it's so easy to be involved with, with those that are are committing these sins. You know, it could be members of your own family or good friends. Because people don't, don't, don't believe in getting married now. They can live together before they decide to get married. And there's all kinds of sneaking around and, uh, you know, committing fornication. And God says we need to, to avoid that. Don't, uh, don't get together with the fornicators of this world or those who are covetous or extortioners or don't, don't, don't get together with the idolaters. Well, they must, you need, you need to go out of, out of the world. But now I have written unto you to keep company, to not keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer and a loud mouth, or somebody's always creating problems, or a drunkard. You know, don't don't keep around or stay around those people. Don't make them your best friends. 
And if they are your best friend, you need to talk to them and tell them they need to get, they need to get their life straightened out. And if you can, you know, do what you can to help them out. That's a struggle when you're caught up in, uh, in drinking. I've, I've seen many, many men over the years, you know, just start with just a drink a day or something like that. The first thing you know, they, they have problems in their family or whatever, and then they go to the bottle thinking the bottle is going to solve their problems. It doesn't. It creates more. And when that happens, we need to, to kind of back away from that friendship. If they don't make a change, we need, to, we need to get out of that company. We judge by the company we keep. It says, for what, what have I to do to judge them also that are outside or without? Do not you judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away uh, from among yourselves that wicked person. When you, when you keep in company with people that are, uh, are committing all these uh, evil sins, we need, to, we're not, we need to move away from that company and find new friends. Uh, you know, do what we can to help them. And I wouldn't say you don't quit monitoring what they're doing, but uh, you don't want to spend your time with them. The first thing you know, you'll be caught up in, 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 in the temptation will get to you. And chapter 6, in verse 9, he said, Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, don't be deceived. Don't be a fornicator or an idolater or adulterer, nor effeminate. Is the LGBT belief right or wrong? He's telling you right there from the scripture. Don't be effeminate. Don't be a, an abuser of themselves which a man, with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists. They won't inherit the kingdom of God. All of us that, that fail and uh, become involved with the sins of the flesh, we're going to lose out on the kingdom if we don't get our life straight and get God's forgiveness and, and turn ourselves around. It happens. You can, you can get caught up in things and uh, the first thing you know, they'll get out of hand. So we need to avoid, you know, uh, people who are committing these, uh, these sins. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We talked about this a little bit this morning. Uh, and I had some people that asked me some questions about it. This is dealing with uh, things, the food that is offered to idols. Whether we should, is it wrong if we eat that, that food? Or if we participate in that? Then we read the whole chapter because uh, it tells us exactly what we need to do. Verse 1 says, Not as touching things, that have, uh, things offered unto idols. We know that we have knowledge, and knowledge puffs up. But uh, love edifies. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing, and he ought to know it. But if a man love God, the same is known of him. You know, his reputation will be, a, he's a man of God. He loves God. And concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. We know that an idol is nothing. That's a clue to what the, what the answer is going to be at the end. So an idol is nothing. We know it. Others might not know it, but we know it. So for though there be that are called God, whether in heaven or in earth, as, as there be many gods and many, and many lords. But to us, there is one God, the Father, to whom all things, and we in him, 
and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So we know that God the Father and Jesus Christ. And that's who we worship. Anyone else is a, is a, a pagan god, a foreign god. So we don't have to worry about foreign gods. It's verse 7 says, How be it then, and not in every man's that knowledge for some with conscience of the idol unto the, the hour, eat, as a, eat it as a thing offered unto idols, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commends us not to God, for neither if we eat are we better, and neither if we don't eat are we worse. It makes no difference whether we eat it or we don't eat it. It's not going to be any better or any worse for us. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty that you have of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. That's the thing we need to consider. How is it going to affect another person if we eat that food? It says, for if any man see you which has knowledge, they know we know what's going on. They know we know what God is. We know how what God's position is on it. And they know we know it. So he said, if any man sees you which has knowledge, sit at, at meet in the idol's temple, and it shall not be, uh, uh, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. And through that knowledge, Shall the weak brother perish whom Christ died, for whom Christ died? So this individual is weak, so you want to be careful how you handle yourself and what you do and what you don't do. He said, but when you sin, so against the brethren, and, and wound his weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So we need to be careful. Verse things, Verse 13 says, whether if meat makes my brother to offend, I will not eat of that flesh while the, while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. So if there's an opportunity for a brother to be offended, then you can't eat it because you're going to hurt his conscience. You need to avoid that type of thing. Now, we've, I, I never ran into a situation like that in my life, so we don't see it all that much here in the United States. But maybe in other countries they have problems with that. We don't have individuals who are sacrificing, you know, in, in the realm of people that I uh, associate with. Nobody's given any animal sacrifices. But the, the, the point is that we have to be careful that we don't offend the other individual. If they think it's, it's wrong for us to eat it, then we shouldn't eat it. But... God also said, we have knowledge. We know that an idol is nothing. If it doesn't offend that individual, then you, you're able to eat it. It's to, to be concerned about the other individual. That whole chapter is dedicated to that subject. So if you get a chance, if you've got any questions about it, just go back and read those 13 verses. And then you'll get a better understanding of how to handle yourself in that type of situation. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we'll read verses 20 through 19 to 21. Galatians 5, 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are, are manifest, which are these. And we mentioned them already. It was adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness, which is being lewd, idolatry, witchcraft. And that's getting more and more popular all the time. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. You know, some people can't hold their temper. They get mad at any, any little thing that sets them off. Strife, 
people who are looking for a fight or looking for some kind of confusion to start that. Seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. Murders are rampant nowadays. We were talking, I was talking to somebody about it uh, yesterday. I went out to my mailbox. My mailbox was getting popular. <laughs> I went out to my mailbox and somebody was parked in my driveway and we had some individuals that walk around a block to exercise and it, they were part of the family and they just happened to meet him at my uh, driveway. And I, I went over there and talked to him and we got to talking about the situation where, where things are around the area right now with New Orleans and all this stuff, all the murders that take place. People don't fight anymore. They just shoot one another. Uh, we used to argue when we were young, younger. If you had an argument with somebody, you argued, and sometimes you, you push one another around a little bit. We didn't even fight all that much. But now they don't even do any of that. You know, if they upset you, they shoot you. So murder, murders are rampant. Envying, murders, drunkenness, works of the flesh, revelings and such like, which I tell you before, as I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a blessing that we have changed and, you know, made progress and uh, don't even consider. It doesn't even enter our minds to, to get involved in all that kind of thing. Let's turn to First Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4. And we'll read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll read uh, up to 7 after that. It says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So we need to have the mind of Christ. And that is the way to cease from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of, it, of this time in the flesh to, to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked again in lasciviousness and lust, excess of wine. You know, it's not wrong to drink wine, but don't drink it to excess. That the scripture say that. that. You know, we all know about the example of uh, Noah getting drunk. You know, and it, his drunkenness bore bad fruit. But it wasn't wrong for him to drink. He drank the excess. And he caused problems. And that's what happens when you drink too much. You don't have control over making uh, good decisions. So God says, the drink, do it in moderation. Don't let it get to the point where you're going to be tipsy. And it affects your decisions. It affects the things that you do. Continuing on, it says, excess of wine, revelings, banqueting, partying, and all this kind of thing, and abominable idolatries. He said, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, and speaking evil of you. Who shall give account of him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel pre preached also unto them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. That's what we need to do. We need to live in the spirit of God. But the end of things is at hand. So, be therefore sober and watch into prayer. You know, let, don't let you, you get, self get caught up on those kind of things and keep in touch with God. Prayer is just conversation with God. And we need to have that conversation with God. You know, we always, we always bring, when we say prayer, we're always thinking about going to God and asking Him help for different things. But prayer is more than that. Prayer is sharing your joy with Him or just talking about things that that uh, come to mind that you think you need help in or, uh, or just tell them about the things that, that are going on and, you know, you know like family and stuff like that. Talk about the, 
what your hopes are for them, and and a lot of different regular conversation like you would have with someone else, with your mother. God wants that connection. And if we have that connection, then we're not going to get ourselves in trouble like all these uh, lust of the flesh. There's so many things that are uh, at our disposal, but we, we just don't use it. Let's turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We also talked a little about, about, about this this morning. The Bible study. Our Bible study is getting better and better. Uh, we need to get more people involved in our Bible studies. First Timothy chapter 2, we'll read verses 3 through 6. Well, let's begin in verse 1. He said, I, exo- I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications and prayer and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For it is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So there is one God. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. There's only one individual to go between the Father and us. And that's his responsibility. Jesus Christ's responsibility is to bring the relationship that we have with him to God so we can have a relationship with the Father. Now, that's perverted too. We have religions that, uh, as I was talking about earlier, that thinks Mary has been assumed into heaven. And now she can intercede for us, and we ought to pray to her. They have all these different things, St. Joseph's altar, and all kinds of different things that they think these individuals have an opportunity to mediate for us, to, to intercede for us. That's a lie. You know, John 3.13 says, only he, that, what, uh, only he that came from heaven uh, can mediate for us. There's only one in heaven, Jesus Christ. This is an important scripture. There's only one, one God and one mediator between God and man. And since there is that one, that's the one we need to to talk too often. He, we ought to be looking for him at all times. Mankind is always looking for blessings. You know, we always want blessings. I want blessings. When I pray, I ask for blessings. Uh, and as a move going in that direction, I want to tell a little story about a, uh, a situation that, that comes up fairly often. Uh, many times I go dancing on Sunday evenings. Uh, we got a, a bingo hall in Booty, a big hall, and on the weekends uh, we have 200 to 300 people that go dancing. And it's mostly an elderly group, people from age, say, 60 to not even 90s. They got a few people in the 90s that, that still go dancing. And after a number of years and stuff, you almost become like a big family. And uh, we dance to, to old 50s music. We call it here in Louisiana, Swamp Pop. Uh, you know, and they got, they got different songs down than just what you hear on the radio because these different bands write their own songs and they sing different songs and stuff. And it's, it's popular if you're having 200 to 300 people on a Sunday evening. And we, we dance from 4 o'clock until 8. And you get home fairly early, so you're not stayed out to... 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, anyhow, now the bands are beginning to uh, begin the dancing period with uh, uh, patriotic songs. And one that we hear quite often is God Bless America Again. And it's moving. When you listen to it, you put your hand over your, your heart and you listen to the band play and, you know, some of them are swaying and all this kind of thing. But these people feel that the words of that song in their heart. 
And they clap and they're happy about asking God to bless America again. What I hear, I think about wanting to get up there and say, yeah, I'm going to tell you all what Leviticus 26 and Leviticus 28 says. That's what pops into my mind. Uh, if only they knew why America is not being blessed today like it was in the past. It's because of our, our idolatry. And he's not going to bless us until we repent and change. And I, I would never get up there and, do, and speak, but I sure have the urge to, to for them to know and get, receive that message. So let's take a look back at uh, Leviticus 26. I want to read a little bit from, a little bit from uh, Leviticus and a little from Deuteronomy. Leviticus 26. If you get a chance, listen to the words of that song. They, they move you. And look how you, like he starts, blessings and cursings for obedience. You shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up an image of stone in your land and bow down to it, for I am the eternal your God. And many of those individuals in there uh, are part of the Mystery Babylon uh, group. They don't even know how severe and how uh, God hates that. They don't even have an idea. It never, it never crosses their mind. Verse 2 says, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary, because I am God. If you walk in my statutes and you keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall le uh, yield their fruit. Your threshing floors shall reach unto the vintage. And a vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and you shall eat of your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safety, safely. What a blessing. That's what, that's what we want. He said, I'll give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. To their people are afraid. They'll lock everything. You got to lock your tool, your shed, your car, your boat. Every, everything you own has got to be locked because somebody's going to come in and, and, and look it over and steal what they want. I'm glad I live in the area where I live uh, because we don't have that much, uh, in, many individuals coming in our subdivision. We've got a number of uh, deputies that live in that area. I got a rental house and I was working on it last week and uh, I went through the back door as a shortcut. I was working on a hot water heater. I got to pull a little slab. And uh, the door rubs on the floor. So I just pushed it where it would stay. The wind wouldn't blow it. So I could take a shortcut to get to get outside where I wanted to get. And when I left, I forgot to close the door. I would just look at the other things. I went around the front of the house and I locked it. And uh, about three or four days later, I went and uh, the door was still jammed the way I had jammed it. And I got uh, some expensive tools inside that, that place. Uh, I got a big power miter saw, my three or four hundred dollars saw. I got a table saw in it, and I got a pressure washer, and all kind of different. So it's not, not real expensive, but around your three, four, five hundred dollars a piece. And I just had that wide open. And then yesterday evening, my neighbor saw me at the mailbox. <laughs> I meet everybody at the mailbox, and he said, "I." Mr. Bobby said, I went over to your house. I saw your door was open. I tried to close it. He said, I closed it, but it, it just opened back up after. And uh, I said, yeah, I, I saw that. I went, went by there uh, one day during the week, and I saw it, and I was just shocked. And I, first thing I went to do to look and see if that power saw was there. <laughs> it was still there. Nobody had touched it. But that's rare. And that was a blessing from God that he took care of my belongings while I, while I, I forgot that the door was open. The older you get, the more that seems to happen more and more often. <laughs> Not that same thing, but all kinds of things like that. But God blesses us. 
In verse 7 he says, oh, maybe verse 6, and I will give peace unto their land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. We're not fighting our battles here in the United States, you know, like it is in other countries, even though we had a few situations where we had to. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will respect, I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And you shall, you shall eat old store, and bring forth the old because of, new, of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage, that you should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke. I took the trouble that you were going through and removed it. And I made you to go upright. For well, God blesses us. And all we have to do is repent and surrender ourselves to him and keep his commandments, all ten of them, and then do things God's way. Keep his statutes and his judgments and some of the ordinances that they have. God just wants us to, to put him first and to do what he says. I think it's in Deut Deuteronomy 6 that it says, choose life. You have a choice to make. Why don't you choose what I tell you to do and receive those blessings? We know those words, but sometimes it's hard for us to make the right choice. But God is telling us that we need to do that. And time is, is getting short, so we need to uh, put a little bit more emphasis on it. Let's read a few of the blessings in Deuteronomy 28. They're a little bit different. These two chapters talk about blessings and cursings. We're not going through the cursings today. I'm just going to go through blessings. Um, it said, It shall come to pass, if you shall hawk and diligent to, into my voice, and your God to observe and do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God shall set you up on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you. And if you hearken unto me, hearken unto the voice of the Lord, blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of your body. And all these blessings that we read in Leviticus 26, I won't be to read as much as I want because my time is, is moving on. And I'll just uh, mention a few things here. Uh, Let's turn to Acts 17 real quick. We'll talk about the Apostle Paul dealing with idolatry. Acts 17. And we'll begin reading in verse 16. I won't be able to read the whole thing because of, of time. Acts chapter 17. And we'll read... Begin reading in verse 16. He says, Paul waited for them at Athens, and his spirit, was, his spirit was stirred up in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons in that market daily with them uh, that met with him. He was there every day for a period of time, and he was out there talking to the people. And, he, and verse, dropping down to verse uh, 21, he said, The Athenians were strangers which were spent their time with in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They wanted to hear new things. And Paul stood in the midst of Morris Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. And we have some people that are superstitious. He said, For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with an inscription of the unknown, unknown God. Well, who is the unknown God? 
God the Father and Jesus Christ. I always wondered what, who the, old, the unknown God was. And right there before our eyes. God the Father and Jesus Christ. They're not known today. What a blessing it is that God called us out and teaches us and tells us who he is. Some weeks back, Mr. Uh, Kerry had told us to read Jeremiah chapter 2 and chapter 3. I ask you to do that because it, it's a, you know, get the message that he wanted us to hear. But I want, when you read it, listen to the emotional tone that these, the scriptures say. It hurt God to his heart to see Israel practice idolatry over and over and over again. It's sad. I was wondering if I was going to have enough information to, to, to last a whole hour, but I'm running out of time. Uh, I wanted to mention that we need to, we need to change the way we, we live and add some things into our lives. We need to examine ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, how do I spend my time and energy and my resources? And what are my priorities? I was talking about the Bible studies that we have. What kind of Bible study do you have in your life? I mean, how many hours a week do you spend not reading, studying God's Word? I would say for most of us, probably very little. We have an opportunity with the Bible studies we give here. What else are you going to be doing on the Sabbath? Sometimes we put other things in front of God including our husbands and our wives and our children. You know, they're, they're, they're most important to us, so we esteem them highly, but we put them before God. You know, we say, first, God is first, family is second, your, your uh, job and <coughs> your career and all that stuff, third and all that kind of stuff, we got that mixed up. We put our careers and stuff way ahead of our God. We're ahead of our families and create problems. We need to get ourselves in line with God. We've got to make God our priority. We've got to make look, uh, studying the scriptures our priority. I had made that list of 100 questions that I gave you. We went through that in our Bible study, and we learned a lot from those scriptures and discussion and all that kind of thing. We need more people to come and be a part of that because you can help us out with some of the things that we discuss. You're part of the family. God wants you to be involved in that. What else are you going to do on the Sabbath? I know we've got family, like I said. Maybe you want to stay home with your husband, or maybe you want to stay home with your wife or whatever, but don't put it ahead of God. Have the desire to want to study God's Word and get to know God better have a better relationship, and have the opportunity to be in the kingdom. With the works of the flesh and all the temptations that we have, we need to have uh, a better relationship with God. And we need to make the change. We need to consider the Ten Commandments before we, we take the Passover this year. We need to dedicate our lives drawing closer to God. So I'm, I'm pleading with you to make a change in your life and get more involved in, in uh, searching for God and, and talking to him and tell him, tell him about what you need to put in your life. Have, a, have a, a frank conversation with him just like he was in the room with you. Idolatry is a sin that we don't consider, but it's one of the most important things to God, so we need to consider it, and we need to make changes. 